and watch it again and share it, you can go to the YouTube channel Pragya CS Studio and then you can see the recording of this meeting. And now we begin our today's meeting. We thank to all the brothers and sisters from India and from uh, abroad for your presence today here with us in this uh, occasion of the celebration of Annie Besant's birthday that as we know is on 1st October, but we wanted to celebrate it uh, some days before. And for that, we have uh, our dear brother Pedro from Australia, who is going to share that with us. And also we have uh, invited our dear brother, Charlie Romero from PS Philippines. But before opening our meeting, let's us, uh, close, your eye, close our eyes and say the universal prayer that our dear Annie Besan has written that is very inspiring. So if you want, you can make yourself comfortable and let's repeat the prayer. Oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. Oh, hidden love, Embracing all in oneness. May all who feel themselves as one with thee know they are therefore one with every other. So today to moderate our meeting, we are very happy to welcome uh, Brother Charlton Jones Romero, who is the National President and General Secretary of the Theosophical Society in the Philippines, as well as the Vice President of the PS in the Pacific Federation. And uh, Brother Charlie has, has inspired many of us with this wonderful work that they are doing in the Theosophical Society in the Philippines since the beginning of the pandemic. He and his team of the TS started a wonderful work of spreading theosophy using the technological online tools with weekly theosophical lectures. So we thank uh, Bro Charlie for that inspiration. And also we want to thank him a lot uh, for having accepted this invitation uh, to be the moderator of today's session. Over to you, Bro Charlie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Catalina. And it is all, I am always happy to be of help, and especially in this special activity, observing the life of our second international president, Annie Besant. So a pleasant afternoon to all, of course, for our brothers and sisters in India and further down the Western Hemisphere. It is, a, it is a good morning. And for our special guest speaker, it is, I think, his tea time. And although he has skipped tea to be with us this uh, today on this uh, special activity. Now, our special guest has written and published just this year a right. book entitled Annie Besant in India. And uh, what we will hear, I think, will not be a rehash of what we could read in that book. He might provide us some interesting facts that has not reached print. So let us pay attention. And uh, later on, we will also have an open forum discussion. But at this time, please allow me the privilege to introduce our guest speaker for today, none other than our brother Pedro Oliveira. Brother Pedro was born in Porto Alegre in Brazil, and he holds a degree in philosophy from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. He joined the Theosophical Society in Brazil way back in 1978 and has worked in various capacities. He served as the international secretary at the society's international headquarters in Adyar, Chennai from 1992 to 1996. He has worked as education coordinator of the TS in Australia, 
president of the Indo-Pacific Federation of the TS and as officer in charge of the editorial office at the international headquarters. Brother Pedro has lectured extensively in many countries on perennial wisdom, spirituality, mysticism, and comparative religion. He is the author of En Sri Ram, A Life of Beneficence and Wisdom, which was published in 2009. Another book published in 2018 is entitled CWL Speaks, CW led Beater's correspondence concerning the 1906 crisis in the Theosophical Society. And as I had mentioned very just recently, he published the book Anibesan in India. He has a lot of articles which appeared in a number of the society's international journals. So brothers and sisters, allow me and let's all welcome our brother, Pedro Oliveira. Brother Pedro. Thank you, Brother Charlie. Uh, and um, good morning to you all. Uh, it is uh, 3.07 in the afternoon in Sydney, but uh, we are all meeting at the same time. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Brother Sikar Agnihotri and Sister Catalina Izaza Kantor for the invitation to address you uh, today on this book. Um, I can tell Brother uh, Charlie that I cannot rehash on this uh, because the book is, is still a novelty. Probably only three people in the world have read it. It has 590 pages. <laughs> so um, anyhow, uh, some, some people may have read it. Um, my intention is just to in introduce the book, uh, some ideas of each chapter and then if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, um, this book um, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, an old project um, uh, that the president, the former president, uh, uh, sis, uh, sis, Mrs. Radha Bournier had, not because she wanted it to be written, but because she received a request from Mr. J. Krishnamurti for her to write it. Um, you know, theosophical history um, uh, sometimes can be compared like a supermarket. People take whatever they want or whatever pleases them. And some people may have suggested that after Krishnamurti um, left the TS to begin his own individual work, that he had <coughs> shelved, so to speak, uh, uh, Dr. Bezen. That is not true according to the historical record. And before he died, as an evidence that it's not true, before he died, he asked Radhaji to write a, a book about Dr. Bezen, a, bio, a biographical book. Now, Radhaji naturally agreed, but she never had the time to do it. So uh, she asked Dr. Sivia Garval and his wife to come from Varanasi where they lived to conduct research for the book at Adyar. And, um, and they did that. Dr. Garval was a very dedicated person. Um, he had a doctorate in chemistry by the Benares Hindu University. Uh, he was also a researcher in his own right, and he wrote a, an important book called Buddhist and Theosophical Movements, which um, enc encapsulates the work of Corner Alcott in Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka, um, the, a, a work centered in um, uh, encouraging Buddhist education in Sri Lanka. Um, and when I visited Sri Lanka, I visited as part of my work as of, for the Indo-Pacific Federation. I, I, I was aware that he founded more than 200 schools there during uh, uh, the period of less than 10 years. Uh, of course, uh, all these schools ended up being, they were being, uh, 
um, uh, um, offered, uh, given over to the government, and uh, a number of them it, it still exist, particularly in the Ananda College in, in, in Colombo. And um, the first principal of the Ananda College was Brother C.W. Ledbeater. That is recorded there. So, um, um, Dr. Agarwal did extensive research and uh, he was very uh, dedicated. And for a number of years, he did research at the RDR Library, at RDR, but also at the archives. And um, uh, when he passed away in 2009, he passed away in June 2009, uh, he, I went to Radhaji's office and I said, if you agree, I can uh, work on his notes and produce a manuscript for you to, to see. And she agreed to that. So um, I, I left ADR in 2011 and um, I, I, I didn't have much time available because I had to work, but I continued the research and the writing over the years. And I had, uh, uh, an almost completed manuscript to show it to her on, on a USB when we went for the um, um, uh, Indo-Pacific Conference in Bali in October, 2013. So we were there, we met a number of members from India and from around the, the Indo-Pacific area. And in the morning, when we were coming down from, from, for breakfast, uh, we received the news that Radhaji had passed away on the 31st of October. So uh, that was quite a, a shock for us. And uh, there was a special memorial meeting for her. Several people addressed the meeting. And so when I came to IDR after the Indo-Pacific Conference, I had the USB with me, but I didn't have Radhaji to show it to her. And, um, but then I went back to, to Australia and continued the, the work. And eventually the book was published uh, with uh, great difficulty. And um, uh, if you have not seen the book, this is the cover of the book. And it was done by Mrs. Uh, um, Nita Agraval, uh, she lives in Chennai. She has done pro bono work for the Theosophical Publishing House. And um, it's a very expressive cover. And uh, so Radhaji wrote, chose the title for this book. Now, I, I had considered other titles, but I went to her and she said the title should be Any Besant in India. It's a very simple title and it says a lot. It says, her presence in India, her work in India, her contribution to India. Um, uh, the first chapter, Radhaji said, should be a condensation of her autobiography. She said, we cannot improve uh, uh, into the writing of Dr. Besant's autobiography, but we can present to the reader a kind of a a summary of the main passages or some important passages. And this was done by Dr. Agarwal painstakingly. Uh, it took quite a while to do this. Um, um, he also discovered in the archives notes uh, um, written on the, on the watchtower in the Theosophy, some of which in the Lucifer magazine written by Basil Hodgson Smith, who was a young theosophist at that time, um, that uh, 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 called 20 years of work. It's, it's like a continuation of the autobiography, which ended in 1893 and, um, and continue for uh, another 20 years. And it's very interesting reading and everything has been included in this book. So you, you can read it. Um, uh, her travels, her, her lecture tours in America and in other places, and um, her travels uh, to India. Uh, I just wanted to mention here uh, very briefly, uh, she, came, she came to India in November, 1893. 
and she traveled extensively, as we know. And in the Theosophist uh, for April 1894, Corner Alcott gave uh, an, a detailed account of her trip. And he said that, that uh, d- uh, her tour covered 15,000 miles of travel by sea and 6,500 miles by land, both in Ceylon and in India. She gave 121 public addresses to at least an aggregate of 100,000 people. So you can see that she did attract quite a lot of interest. I have read, and it is in the book as well, that when she arrived in India in November, 1893, uh, her first address was in Tutikorin, in, in, in the very southernmost part of India. And in those days, they didn't have microphone, they didn't have television, they didn't have um, uh, WhatsApp or Facebook, they just had newspapers. And at her very first talk in Tutikorin, Soon after she arrived, there were 7,000 people. So you you can see that uh, she was already well known by by that time. But the important thing, and this I consider one of the foundations of her work for, for India and in India, on the page 81 of the book, um, I really, um, I, I need help of some of you, but she, she visited Berenpore. I don't know, is this in UP? Berenpore, is it UP? Anyhow, perhaps somebody can help me. Uh, she was in Berenpore, and there was a great gathering of Nudia, Nadia, and other pundits to greet her. And in their joint address to her in Sanskrit, this is Colonel Alcott speaking, in 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 her um, joint address to her in Sanskrit, they ingeniously paraphrased her name into the honorific title, Anna Vazant. Anna Vazant, which means the giver of nourishment to the whole world. That's, that's how she, they saw her, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a real uh, servant of humanity and with a, a very clear message. And the important thing for us, because that affirms what is the nature of the- theosophical leadership, the important thing is she never attracted attention to herself. She wanted the attention of people to be drawn to the work to be done in India and to the ideal of service. She never accepted personal worship. So this is just one passage. Um, The first chapter is, uh, as I said, a a kind of a summing up of her autobiography. All the important points are there, you know, her training, her reading when she was a young girl, she was fascinated by the lives of the saints and, and, and she meditated on their qualities, their sacrifices and so on. Uh, but she was also interested in the suffering of humanity. She married a, a, an Anglican priest who, was, who turned out to be a violent man and therefore the, Mrs. Besson suffered domestic violence. And that was one of the reasons why uh, she sought divorce from him. Um, She discovered her own power of oratory. You know, she she won uh, as the the, uh, wife of the vicar, she had certain responsibilities in that church. And she once entered the church when the church was empty and she climbed onto the pulpit where people preach and she gave a sermon to an empty church and she discovered her capacity to speak to the soul of people, not trying to convince people, not trying to be an ideologue, 
you know, or a propagandist, but we speak to the soul of people and therefore to awaken the soul of people. This is what she did. Eventually she, she, she divorced the Frank Bazin, the Reverend Frank Bazin, and moved to her own accommodations and he started her political work. And um, um, she for a while was a Fabian socialist. Um, and, and then she, uh, she uh, met uh, an MP uh, uh, in, England, in London called Charles Bradlaugh. And um, um, he was a very important influence in her life. And uh, they together published the little book called Fruits of Philosophy about family planning, in, in necessary family planning in England. And for that, they were arrested. And her husband, her former husband used the, the publication to move a, a lawsuit against her and claim the custody of her daughter, Mabel. That was one of the darkest points in Mrs. Bazin's life and she almost committed suicide. She had the poison, the bottle with poison in her hand, and she was about to drink it when she heard this voice saying, coward, you want to work for humanity and you can endure a few, um, a, 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 few a, a, a short period of suffering. And when she heard that voice, she, she smashed the bottle against the, the wall never to attempt that again. Um, she did enormous work for the downtrodden in India. During her, during her trial with Bradlaugh uh, uh, regarding the fruits of philosophy, which presented instructions about contraceptive methods, um, one of the judges, she was being charged according to obscenity laws in England and one of the judges said, Mrs. Bezan, your book is obscene. She chose to defend herself. She didn't engage any lawyer. And he said, your book is obscene. And then um, uh, uh, she said, you consider my book obscene, but you do not consider the poverty in East End in London obscene, do you? So eventually she was not convicted. She had to pay a certain fine. She continued for other, with other causes. She was a member of the London School Board, uh, uh, she, which trained her in, in education, which was very important for her, her future work in, in, in Madras. And um, um, eventually um, uh, she was working in, in a, in a newspaper called Pall Mall Gazette. And um, uh, the editor asked her to review some two thick volumes uh, of a book by Madame Blavatsky called The, the Secret Doctrine. So she did that and she, re she read them during a weekend and wrote the review and even today, um, very serious and uh, seasoned students of theosophy consider that it's one of the best reviews ever written of the secret doctrine. That was the view of Miziante Hoskins from England. Um, so she asked to meet Madame Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky was very moved to meet her. He actually said to her, Mrs. Bezen, how long have I wait, waited to meet you and so on. Uh, so she com completely embraced the, the cause of the, the, of the TS. And um, in 1893, she visited Indian blood. That was literally a, a life-changing visit for her, as I already mentioned. But she also visited other countries as well. She had lecture tours in the US. It attracted thousands of people. Um, um, one of the appendix at the end lists all the books and pamphlets she wrote, and it's impossible to believe that one person could write all that, having lived a life of complete work and service, 24 hours almost. The, the, the third chapter is called Sanatana Dharma, also written by Dr. Agarwal. Um, 
It's called uh, Education Through Timeless Values. And uh, it, it, it records her, her interest for the Indian education, her um, fundraising tours. In 1895, she was in England doing a fundraising for a, a school in India. The very first theosophical school in India was operated in the home of Mrs. Francesca Arundale, who was a theosophist uh, and the aunt of George Sidney Arundale. And, um, and then she continued with this work, um, uh, pr profound work, and um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, 1930, in, 19, um, um, in 1916, uh, sorry, uh, in 1913, she founded the Central Hindu College in Benares, which also became very important. It was later made into the nucleus of Benares Hindu University. Um, um, and, and she wanted the college to be profound to have the best Hindu values in the sense that she said she, she didn't believe in secular education alone. She said there were virtues in secular education, but I, I, uh, an education should include a, a, an education of the soul and not just of the brain. And this was one of the wrong points with Western education, that it produces very big brains, which we can see nowadays, no? But the, some people, some of these people use those brains to accumulate more and more wealth and not to work for the transformation of the world. Um, there was a problem uh, so soon after she created the, the, uh, the Center of Hindu College because uh, the young Krishnamurti was discovered in 1909 um, by C.W. Leadbeater on the beach at Adyar, and he could see that that was a very special boy. His, his aura was free from any particle of selfishness. And Dr. Besson later on confirmed that. So the, both of them were convinced that uh, that boy would be the vehicle for a new teaching for the world. But some of her colleagues in Benares didn't agree and Dr. Bhagavan Das was rather upset and in a state of being upset, if you have ever been upset, you, you realize that when you are upset, you say certain things that you didn't mean. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Bhagavan Das, he, he wrote some very harsh articles against her in the magazine of the Indian section, even suggesting that her mental faculties were suffering. She never responded to that. She never uh, responded personally. She continued to work. Eventually, uh, the central uh, there was a request from Pandi Malavia to uh, use the Central Hindu College as the foundation for a, a Hindu university, Benares Hindu University, and she promptly agreed. She continued to do some educational work, and then eventually. Uh, she got involved into political work in India. Before that, we have to put on record, and that's what chapter three is, uh, chapter four, so, uh, sorry, um, her work as president of the TS. She expanded, for example, Adyar, who had 27 acres probably when Corner Awkward and Madame Blavatsky acquired the property. She expanded from 27 acres or 25 acres to 253 acres, 10 times the original size, right? Uh, she gave enormous impetus to theosophical literature. She founded the Vazanta Press and the Theosophical Publishing House. Um, and one of her keynotes is Theosophies for All. She, she did say that in one of her manuals, theosophical manuals that she had received complaints that the theosophical literature at that time was rather expensive. Just imagine, not many people could buy three volumes of the Secret Doctrine or the two original volumes, very thick books. So she started this popularization of theosophy, which was very successful. And 
She inherited a membership of 12,000 people in 1907 when Corner Orchard passed away. And the, the, the membership grew in, in 1928, it was 45,000 people, right? Which also included members of the Order of the Star. She did a lot for the TS. She emphasized again and again that the society should remain non-dogmatic, compassionate. It should be it should be made of members who have a commitment to to serve humanity and to acquire knowledge, not to benefit themselves or not to shine on their own, but to to acquire knowledge in order to serve. Uh, almost as if the motto was to know is to serve fundamentally. So um, she did, uh, and the society is very much indebted to what she did um, uh, as president. And, and also it has to be remembered here that she started the Theosophical Order of Service. She knew that the Theosophical Society could not take practical stance on some controversial issues because it would divide the membership. So she created the Theosophical Order of Service to work for animals, to make campaigns against discrimination, uh, prison reform, and so on. And it continues. Now, one, of this, one of the current success stories of that is the Bezen, anima, uh, uh, Bezen Memorial Animal Dispensary at RDR, which you, we have been seeing in, in some online vehicles. Um, another part of her work involved the, 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 the work of Krishna Ji and the World Teacher Movement. As I said, she was convinced that um, uh, Krishnamurti would be the vehicle of a, a new teaching. And, um, uh, and uh, it, it is now part of history that in 1929, he dissociated himself from that vision and he went on his own work as a, as, a, as a speaker and teacher in the world. Um, but he never lost uh, his affection for her. Um, um, this, there are very controversial uh, uh, areas in this uh, chapter, but the book doesn't see controversy. The book simply relates uh, uh, facts. One of the controversies is that uh, in, 2000, in 1925, Dr. Bezen seemed to endorse the views of some leading theosophists that they were attaining several initiations. This was published in, in 1925 because of there was a star um, uh, camp in Omen in Holland. And, uh, and she seemed to, to have endorsed that. But later on, she would reiterate that, that what she really considered important is that in the TS, we, we avoid the danger, as she said, of crystallization of thought. She had studied the nature of the human mind and she knew how, it, how easy it is for the human mind uh, to, uh, to become crystallized in habits of thought, belief and so on, you know. Uh, Winston Churchill has a very good line about this. He said, a fanatic is someone uh, who cannot change his mind and never changes the subject. So uh, this is one of the dangers that she drew attention to, that uh, the society, and Madame Blavatsky also had said the same thing. She said, if members cannot, cannot understand the nature of their conditioning and end their conditioning, the society could end up in a, in a sand bank, like, a, like a, a, a boat in a sand bank, you know, uh, destitute of life. So she, she, view, she viewed this. And, uh, but she made a clarification at a, 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 through a communique that, that she never said 
she never said that Krishna G was the world teacher. This is an important point. She never said that. She said she wrote this memo to the press very categorically. She, she never said that. She said that she, she was the vehicle. Now, the book also includes some statements by Mr. Krishnamurti when he was about to die in Ohio in February 1986. One of the statements he said, which is now very well known, he says that um, for 70 years, this super intelligence has been utilizing this body, but now the body cannot stand anymore. And you will not see this super intelligence working through another human body in several hundred years. Some of those who have studied his life and his bi the biography about him and so on, realize that uh, what he said had direct relevance to what Dr. Bezan and C.W. Ledbetter had said. But this is for every reader to come to their own conclusion. And now we come to basically her work for India, her vision for India. What is her vision for India? It is a vision encapsulated in one word, Dharma. You know, the word Dharma has many different meanings, order, teaching, law, um, the essential nature of something. But for her, uh, for India to awake from its slumber, as she said, it, it's, it, it needs to understand this law, Dharma, and apply it to life. And, and she would say as well that religion would play a role there, but not the religion based on superstition. This is another sensitive point. For her and, uh, and for Madame Blavatsky, religion is not the empty, esoteric, exoteric form side of the tradition. Religion is a, a live reality. It's something which is alive. It is a perception of the unity of all life. And she, she wanted this kind of perception adapted even to young boys and girls at school. And not just as a metaphysical exercise. Um, but if she doesn't stop in there. She is saying that, um, uh, India also needed to produce its own materials, you know, clothes, uh, and uh, uh, India should join the the the, uh, the 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 world of commerce in the world, yeah. because, for example, India has very unique clothes and and fabrics, for example, that probably the world would be interested, and and in, in encouraging that. If a government committed to the well-being of India would encourage that, that would generate jobs. She was very concerned about that. She was also very adamant against child marriage. She, there is on one, one report that somebody tipped her, tipped her about um, a, a man who was about to marry his nine-year-old daughter. She discovered his village and she went there and she said to him in no uncertain words, you are a brute if you think you can marry your children, your daughter at nine years of age. She campaigned against that. She campaigned against, uh, she campaigned in favor of well-being and protection of women in India. Um, and, and of course, she also had this view and she was very much inspired by the laws of Manu that, that um, the, the political system of India should, should be based on a, a sense of self-responsibility and not dominated by party politics. Self-responsibility means that if you are elected to the parliament or to any level of legislative representation, you are not there to enrich yourself, 
you are not there to favor your friends or your family. You are there to serve the nation. And judging by the standards that we see in the world today, the world as a whole has not understood this. Because when someone is elected for parliament or at any level, there may be lurking within the mind the idea that they should use that mandate also to enrich themselves or to favor certain people. She had a very clear vision of India. Um, in chapter seven, she talks about India's awakening. And it's a very again, beautiful um, uh, way of presenting her thoughts. And, and she, 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 she says, for example, that some of the, some of the wealthy Maharajas in India, you see in those days, the Maharajas still existed. They only ceased to exist in 1947, I am told. In Brazil, they, are, they still exist, but they are not Indians. They are Brazilian Maharajas. But uh, uh, in, uh, she said, some of the wealthy Maharajas could put together an educational fund to foster real education for Indians and so on. And, and he, she said that that would not be a mere donation. They would be investing in the future of the whole country. Um, she also addresses the, the, the question of the, the whole nature of the Indian parliament and um, later on in what she called the Commonwealth for India bill, um, which was supposed to be a constitution for India. But it, it, it never survived after the first reading in the British Parliament. Now, she didn't become depressed after that. She did what she could. But here, between these two subjects, comes another defining moment of her life. In, in 1970, sorry, in, 19, in, 19, in 1914, she bought. Um, a, a newspaper in Madras, the Madras Standard, and rename it New India. And that became the vehicle for her ideas about Indian home rule. She deferred from certain leadership in India that wanted India completely independent from England. She was, what she said, a kind of a moderate. She wanted home rule, but she also wanted India to be part of the Commonwealth. And, and, and then because of her articles in New India, she attracted the attention of the authorities and she was in turn. That is the term they use for house arrest. She was house arrest in the New Guineas in Wutakamand, where the TS had a property. And for three months she was there with George Arundale and BP Wadja, who are very staunch supporters of Dr. Besant. And um, um, Dr. Arundale said that the, the house arrest had a certain effect on her because she was a very active woman. But after she left, she, um, uh, I'll just show you here in the, in the center of the book, there are some pictures. This is the kind of crowd, the crowd that greeted her back in Madras in 1917 after she, had, after she had been released. And in another photograph, which I, I hope you can see, um, yes, in another photograph also in Madras, there is a man holding a placard saying, long live our dear Annie Bassett. Uh, little up, uh, Brother Pedro, little up. Sorry? Uh, huh, no. little, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, can you see? Yeah, no. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, you, you see, you cannot stage this. This is a natural demonstration of affection for her. And, um, and soon after that, in September, she was elected president of the Indian National Congress. There is a historical import, a point of importance here because one of the founders of the International Congress was nobody less than 
Alan Octavian Hume, who did receive some letters from the Mahatmas in the beginning. And uh, he, he really believed uh, uh, in the future of India. And um, so she, um, she um, was the, the president of the Indian National Congress. But by that time, Gandhiji had come from, back from South Africa to India and he, uh, he was very well received. And there was a difference of opinion between her and Gandhiji. And this difference of opinion, some historians have said, ended up in Dr. Bezan being shelved, so to speak. If you read this book, you realize that she was never shelved. She continued her work. She accepted the fact that the leadership didn't accept her political views and, uh, and they opted for the policy of um, non-cooperation or civil disobedience. She was convinced that if you go on the path of civil disobedience, she said, you will teach people to break the law and you can never teach them to respect the law again. Anyhow, so when, when there was this difference of opinion, she continued her work with, through New India and then she gave more emphasis to education. F nothing less than 49, 49 educational institutions were founded in India either by her or inspired by her. And um, uh, this, this is very important. And uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, and because it, it expresses what kind of person she was. Um, when she was there uh, for the dissolution of the Order of the Star in the East in Omen, Holland in August, 1929, after Krishnamurti had made the the, the statement, a reporter from Reuters came to her and said, Dr. Besant, you have announced this boy to the world. You have encouraged him, you have educated him, you have given him your affection. And now he has dissolved, sorry, he has uh, destroyed everything that you believed in. What do you have to say? And uh, Dr. Besson looked at him. I, 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 I must share with you a theory I have. Every time you ask a person, uh, uh, you ask a question of a person who is wise, you have to be prepared for self-demolition. Because, because a person who is wise does not function within the parameters of the conditioned mind. And so he asked this question, what do you have to say? You have given everything to this young man. Now he has destroyed it all. And she looked at him, at this reporter from Reuters and said, I feel inclined like, I feel inclined to listen, to sit and listen rather than pass judgment by one, uh, by, pass judgment on the actions of someone whom I consider by far my superior. And from that day onward, from August 1929 onwards, every time you see a photograph of Dr. Bezan and Krishna Ji, she's sitting in the audience. Before that date, she's sitting with Krishna Ji on the dais in front. But after that, she sat in the audience, she being the president of the society. In other words, she accepted his decision, she took her role. And uh, she believed, she still believed that he uh, would have a, a, a contribution to make. Many years later, and Radhaji was there, there was a conversation at Brockwood Park, an educational center that Mr. Krishnamurti started in the early 1970s. She said, uh, 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 Krishnamurti said, of all the theosophists, at that time, the one which was closest to complete transformation was Amma or any person. And somebody asked him why. Again, remember my theory of when you ask a question to a wise person, Krishnaji looked at this person and said, because you don't know how deep her capacity for love was. So, 
you see, we, we may think that transformation comes with knowledge or even with insight, but he is suggesting that there cannot be any transformation that if we don't come to know what love is. Um, um, uh, finally, I wanted to show you as well, I don't know if it is possible. Um, I think it is possible, yes. Um, Uh, she was very weak and uh, and um, in 1931, uh, Mr. Sri Ram was her personal secretary at that time. And in December 1931, she sent him a birthday card. And the birthday card said, she, she didn't call him Sri Ram. She said, Sri Rama or the, the avatar, Lord Rama, right? That what's his, man, uh, his name means, means. And she said, to Sri Rama. And the only message was, endeavor to the end. It is so easy to give up. It is very tempting to give up. But that's what she said to him, endeavor to the end. And this is precisely what he did. And then the last picture in this book is of Bhagavan Das. I don't know if you can see it. But Dr. Bhagavan Das carrying her ashes to be immersed in the Ganga. And the story here is that after he immersed the ashes, you know, he had differences with Dr. Bezen and he expressed his differences rather harshly. After he immersed the, the, the ashes, his son said, Father, do you know on that occasion where you, you were seriously ill? The person who was, the person who was taking care of you with my mother was Dr. Besant. And then Bhagavan Das was very moved and, and he said to his son, and you tell me after, this after I have immersed her ashes in the Ganga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Pedro, for highlighting those significant milestones in the life of our dear Dr. Annie Besant. Now, uh, we will open the floor for some questions, but I think uh, the top question in mind of everyone is, where do we acquire this, a copies of these books, uh, Brother? Well. I am I'm not at liberty to say anything because it's not for me to say, but we are working towards producing an Indian edition of this book. Yeah. But uh, uh, there are copies available of the Australian edition. And if you write to the email address of Olive Tree Publishing, which is OT uh, Publishing at bigpond.com, this is also on Facebook, then uh, you can place an order. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have, uh, we'll invite uh, our participants to either post their questions on the chat box. We're receiving some questions via WhatsApp and uh, on the comment sections on YouTube. But let us first acknowledge the virtual hand raised by Dr. Mohini Goswami. Uh, Dr. Goswami, you may unmute your microphone and uh, ask your question. Okay, while we are waiting for Brother Goswami, uh, let me just uh, read some of the questions uh, sent through WhatsApp. One question asks, 
Good afternoon, sir. You talked about Dr. Besant's contribution to India. Could you throw some light on her contribution towards India's independence? Yes, her main contribution, one of her main contribution is to start the newspaper New India because she invited the thoughts and concerns of many, of a whole generation of young Indians who work with her. Um, and she lectured for, uh, for the, um, she didn't use the word independence, she used the word home rule. She wanted India to have its own government and, um, and, and determined by its own people. And she, she wanted the dependency of the British government to, to, to come to an end. And I would say that uh, her main contribution was um, uh, um, New India. And I, 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 I hope that uh, someone uh, uh, will have one day the idea of creating an entire website uh, about uh, all the issues of New India so that people can have a very clear idea of what her meant was. But he, as I mentioned here, education was a fundamental point for, for home rule because she, she wanted to see a new generation of Indians uh, loving their country, uh, their traditions, but at the same time, not becoming dogmatic or divisive. Um, so this was also uh, very important. And of, I would say that the, the, her, her best contribution for Indian home rule was herself. Okay, maybe uh, this other question might be treated as a follow-up question. You have mentioned her influence in education. What is the core idea or the essence of her educational philosophy? Yes. Dr. Bezan was a, an accomplished Raja Yogi. So her view of education included for the human being to blossom um, intellectually, uh, emotionally, uh, but also spiritually. So uh, she, she, she viewed education as um, a task of helping people to know themselves at a very deep level. And she said that this was possible even for children because you don't need to discuss philosophy with children, but if you give them some tasks, they will understand. For example, taking care of animals, being responsible for animals, you know. Uh, yes, I would say that um, uh, 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 integrating these three uh, aspects of will, uh, uh, wisdom and, and, and intellect um, um, and also having um, um, uh, discovering this capacity to make these faculties to generate a sense of love for others, you know, as, as she, she, she demonstrated. Yes. Okay. Here's a question. It is said that Dr. Annie Besant was a reincarnation of the same soul that incarnated as G Girodano Bruno. Did you find any mention of that during your research for the book? Yes. Uh, she gave two very well attended talks about Giordano Bruno at the Sorbonne University in Paris, but she didn't say she was Giordano Bruno. Um, actually, the idea that she was Giordano Bruno was, uh, uh, came from from um, Mr. Ledbetter, but he presented that at his own, as his own perception. Um, uh, it is very tricky to make any accurate statement about reincarnations, you, you know, particularly when there are people who are very easy to, to believe that uh, they were the reincarnation of great people. 
when I was international secretary, I received a letter from a lady in the US who was convinced that she was the reincarnation of Madame Blavatsky. And in the same letter, she said, I met Mr. John Coates, the then president at the Centennial of the Society in New York in 1973. And I said, Mr. Coates, I am the reincarnation of Adam Blavatsky. And John Coates, who was very democratic and sympathetic, his, he, he was very tall, six foot four. He said to her, you are the fourth person with the same claim. And so far I have been unable to make up my mind. It's a very diplomatic way of saying it. Yes, okay. Sir, can I speak something? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm Rajam God, yes. I'm not able uh, to Rajam. Yeah, I'm not able to yes. unmute, but I hope now I am. Can I say ahead. something? Uh, let's acknowledge Dr. Rajam Pillai. Uh -huh. I'm not able to unmute. Go ahead. You're getting, you. much, you're getting much. We can, we yeah, can we hear can you, Dr. Rajam. We can hear you. Uh, sir, I would have been the third reader of the book because I have emailed the publisher and got the answer after six months. Just recently got the, uh, this thing. Sir, I am a reader of uh, Gandhian politics. I was part of the Mani Bhavan. And I feel great injustice has been done to Can Annie Besant. Annie Besant's whole political career was demolished. She was, was Amma of entire South India. Amma, they used to call Gujarat when you had her. But once Gandhian influence started, people sidelined her. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm coming from politics into animation, and then I realized, you no, know, she was not giving. And here also you are saying she she wasn't shelved, but actually, uh, I feel she had two big setbacks in her life, heartbreaking setbacks. One was J.K. and another was Homebrew. By Lokmana Tilak and big people, Bhagwan Das were her associate. Bhagwan Das' son, Sri Prakash was the governor of Bombay and he has written her biography and there he says how they together have done a lot of work mm. but this J. Krishnamurti thing has split theosophy into vertical and horizontal and Gandhi showed respect it is very easy to show respect she demolished and eventually she was made the president of Indian National Congress people remember only that I'm sorry, I think, uh, I don't know how much this book is doing justice to her character. And people may say, I'm sorry, I speak a bit of Hindi. The white skin was defeated because of the brown skin. Gandhi's leadership, deliberately, deliberately Gandhians have demolished. That's what I feel very strongly about. Sorry. Thank you. But the, the fact is that this book was put, if this book was put together by a Dorai, it's uh, all is not lost. It's okay, it's okay. I hope, I hope. Agarwal has done yeah. enough justice. If you, if you read the book, you will see, I, I didn't want to go into this question because I was invited to give another presentation on the 1st of October. And it will be exclusively about testimonies of the young Indians who work with her, it, which will include the difficult times in which the Gandhian leadership shunted her aside or uh, tr uh, tried to. And she, she, she continued to work, you know? When she was, uh, when there were differences of opinion with Dr. Bhagavan Das, continue to, continue to work. And, uh, um, uh, and when Krishnaji made his own decision, she accepted. And she, she was an old lady at that time. She was a tall but, uh, she was a very tall. Uh, but she 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 accepted and and and, and it continued. Um I I mentioned this in the beginning, the introduction, I didn't have time to say this. 
she received the best expert advice to translate the Gita from pundits in Banaras. And thanks to Mrs. Manju Sundaram from Benares, I have included their short bio biography here. And you, if you read that, you will see how highly qualified they were. So she has not only studied the Gita, she, she was a yogi. She went into the teachings very profoundly. And one of the things that she says uh, throughout her books, but also it is mentioned here that, that there is such a thing as sthita pranya. That means if we allow ourselves to be disappointed by difficulties or betrayals or whatever it is, then of course we will waste time. But she didn't, she didn't have time to waste. She was a servant of humanity. So when one door closed, she, she, she would find other doors. And she, she, she did an enormous contribution for Indian education. Anyhow, are there other, other questions, uh, Charlie, sir? Yes. Uh, we have uh, one question here regarding uh, requesting you to shed some light on the response of Dr. Besan when Jiddu Krishnamurti refused to be the world lead leader. Well, I did mention uh, her, her reply to the German journalist, right? Yes. And um, she, uh, she, um, uh, she didn't close down the TS, you know, because if you interpret that, uh, decision of uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, it's, uh, for example, if you interpret the, the, the whole speech, there is no truth is a pathless land. If you interpret that literally, the Theosophical Society will have to be closed down. All other organizations will have to be closed down. People will have to search for truth among themselves. Uh, uh, as a student of theosophy and, and also of the, the, the work of Madame Blavatsky, I, I, I am prepared to say, and there is a statement in an article by the Madame Blavatsky of 1889. It is in the collected writings. She said, the Theosophical Society does not teach anything, does not believe in anything, does not accept anything. When I mentioned this in a, in a conference in Brazil, some friends came to me and said, are you sure? Are you exaggerating? I said, well, I can give you the reference. You can go and see for yourself. But does, does, that, does, does that mean that the society has become a kind of a, a, a tabula rasa or that, that people uh, will, will think, uh, whatever they want and they have, will come up with whatever ideas. No, she was simply saying, and this is an important point, she was simply saying that the society gives the mandate for people to present to members, but the society remains free from affiliations. The society, the society remains free from points of view. And I have studied uh, one of the sermons of the Majima Nikaya of the Buddhist tradition. I think that should be perhaps disseminated far and wide. The Buddha was at a certain location with Ananda, his disciple. A, a, a renouncer, a renouncing a, a, a wanderer called Vachagota came to him and said, is there a permanent self in man? The Buddha was silent. Then he said, is there not a permanent self in man? The Buddha was silent. Then Vachagota left. The moment Vachagota left, Ananda asked, why did the Tathagata remain silent before the questions of Vachagota? 
the Anandas, uh, the Buddha said, Anand, listen. Now, when a great teacher says, listen, he's going to say something very important. He says, Anand, listen. If I had said yes to the first question, a whole school of thought would be formed. If I had said no to the second question, a whole school of thought would be formed. And then he said, Anand, listen. The Tathagata has no views. Somebody who attained the knowledge of truth doesn't have opinions. Now, the society doesn't claim to have the fundamental truth, but it wants to be a free platform for people to investigate. And, and therefore, therefore, Dr. Bezan was honoring this tradition. She continued her work. Krishnamurti is free to do whatever he wants. He, he is his own person. Her work for him was done. She, she helped him. She educated him. She defended him in court. But he followed his own. And yet, he maintained the deepest love and affection for her. You know, I think I have spoken too long, isn't yeah. it? Okay. We have a spotlighted brother Dinataram uh, with us here. Brother, yes. please. Go ahead. Namaste, Pedro. Namaste. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. In, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned about Baharampur, where Besan visited. You remember? Yeah. Now, uh, in that uh, Baharampur is in Bengal, West Bengal. Oh, Bengal. In, uh, Bengal, um, in Murshidabad district. Oh. Murshidabad. That um, district has a very historic importance because their people assembled there were freedom fighters at that time, just like um, Raj Bihari Bose, like that. Such people were there, all prominent uh, leaders. And another important thing, a song of welcome was given to Dr. Besant. That is uh, in Indian language called Mangalapatra. You may be knowing that term, Mangalapatra. That Mangalapatra depicts the true condition of India at that time. I shall just uh, uh, read the portion from Old Dairy Leaves by H.S. Holcott. The volume is fifth volume I'm mm -hmm. having. Um, welcome, sister. The ever unfortunate mother India takes you to her bosom. Now she has nothing precious of which she can make a present to you. But she is ready to receive you with the sacrificial fuel. Kushan and a seat made of sacrificial grass, padhya, water for washing the feet with argya, respectful oblation and seed bird. What has brought you, sister, here? India is now lifeless. Here is now no chanting of the Vedas, no Tabovana, garden of practicing religious hostilities, no twice born, that is Brahmin shuttering mantras, mystical incantation. Now the cry of the famine stricken people rents the sky. That was the condition of India at that time. Fam food, famine, illiteracy, and all these things were present at that time. We, the inhabitants of Beharampur, give a garland of flowers around your neck. Please take it Simple sister, with your charismatic affability, you are now a learned daughter of Mother India. You are honored throughout the world, and your reputation is worldwide. We are glad to see you. That was a welcome address or Mangala Patra given to Dr. Besant. Another Thank thing, uh, another thing, I would like to congratulate you for conducting this. Uh, you yourself and late uh, our C. V. Agarwalji for this deep uh, research on this subject. We have many things to add that book. It may, it may, it can be appeared in the next edition of the book. If it is, uh, it will be more appealing to the Indian also. When Gandhiji was the president of the Indian National Congress, that was the only time when he was the president of the Indian National Congress. That uh, session was held in Belgaum in 1924. So Besant was invited there for uh, attending it. And due to some, um, due to the delay of train or something, she was late for a few seconds for that meeting. The session already started. And Gandhiji was uh, sitting there. When he saw that Besant is coming, he raised from the dais and uh, folded his hands as a respect for the whole audience who were present at the Belgam Congress. 
raised uh, themselves and welcomed her but she declined to sit on the dais instead of that she sat at the president former president for sitting that was our doctor great besant i would like to share that view she also uh, fully contributed that swadeshi movement uh, popularized by gandhi ji she started the learning spinning charkha and all that things and uh, there was also very interesting but modern india neglected her i fully agree with uh, rajam pillai because uh, two of her colleagues uh, for example dr bhagwan das was the first uh, one of the recipients of bharat ratna for from india government the highest civilian honor and malaviya ji also got a few years ago but uh, uh, besant was neglected just like many other eminent um, adopted sons of uh, son and daughters of india anyway the lecture was wonderful we expect thank you, uh, thank you sir thank you very anything much anything else sir uh, we have uh, somebody else Uh, maybe last short comment from Dr. Ramanujan Chari. If a short yeah. comment, if uh, if time permits, Brother Chali, then we okay. will close here. Okay. Brother, go ahead. Brother Ramanujan Chari, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, I have done that. No, there are many things that uh, Dr. Besant taught to the public. First point is punctuality. she is very particular about maintaining punctuality in personal life and meetings and another thing is every september and she used to close her bank accounts and treasures and start afresh on 1st october she wants every organization every person to do that start afresh every year don't Uh, culture, the fixed deposit business, and all that. And then there is another point. Uh, she wanted the Banaras Hindu University to be named Banaras Indian University, but that was not approved by the board of directors for their own reasons. And so we have Hindu University, and uh, the. the very spirit of dr besant is lost in that moment and then she expanded the membership of the disabled society to a great extent and not only that she extended the properties at adyar and made adyar the real home of the masters and the allied organizations she started are flourishing particularly these of the order of service and all that educational movement and all that she gave the first school to benares university that is one thing she gave her first school at madras to krishnamurti to start his rishi valley school this is something which many people do not know she transferred all her staff to the rishi valley and the important principal of that school is one gv swarao uh, who was living in adyar and in the last days of his life also he was living in adyar uh, i'm being invited by mr sri ram to do that and then expansion of uh, the theosophical principles is the great thing he did and all the all the work the political work had to come to a stop perhaps because she was against the non cooperation movement as well as the students participation in political activities today in india we have all these difficulties and all these are because of our neglecting what dr besant said in her days and then uh the wake up india uh, uh lecture she gave talk about the social work education and politics etc and uh, uh, apart from all this i thank mr pedro for his beautiful presentation as well as the book 
I wish the book should be reprinted in India by Kisar Film Publishing Work, Publishing House. I would recommend to Mr. Tim Boyd to do that so that we can have a, an Indian edition at a less cost so that we can afford it. And with these findings, I think I take leave of you and thank the organizers for allowing me to speak. Thank you once again. And in particular, thanks to Mr. Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, brother, uh, for that uh, insight. Of course, uh, time is uh, very short for other sharings in the life of Annie Besant, as uh, brother Pedro mentioned. He still has an appointment in October 1. We could also catch him then. But uh, maybe as uh, we wind up uh, this session, we could ask our brother Pedro Oliveira for some uh, a summation or some uh, last few words. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I would like again to thank uh, uh, Brother Shikara Knihotri and Sister Catalina Isaza Cantor for organizing this event. Uh, Brother Charlie Romero for uh, masterfully moderating it and uh, uh, from the Philippines and uh, um, um, and I, I hope the book can contribute a little to the uh, better knowledge of the, Dr. Besson's work. Of course, it's not a complete uh, presentation. We had many limitations and uh, um, the scope of the book was limited. We didn't have the time or the resources for a full biography that would demand travel and research in different continents. But uh, anybody who reads the book will see that uh, uh, her dedication never ceased. You know, she, uh, not only that, she was able to inspire people um, in their lives. And um, uh, uh, somebody mentioned Sri Prakash. Uh, and uh, uh, he said in one of his testimonies that Whenever he knew that she was coming to Benares in December, he was very excited because he knew she was going to bring him some gifts. So she was one of the busiest persons in, her, in, in India at that time. She never forgot to bring gifts for a little boy, you know. And, um, and as I said, she had quite a, a number of upsets in her life, but uh, she didn't allow that to drive her into the ground. She continued to work, you know. And remember what she said to Sri Ram in that card. Uh, in, in Latin, they say, eniteri ad finen. In English, we say, endeavor till the end, you know. And uh, that means our work here is done only when the incarnation draws to a close, you know. Uh, and uh, all the authors will say, then other work will begin you know, whenever. Uh, 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 and and, and uh, she, also, she also was very clear that, uh, that she believed that the Theosophical Society had a very important work to do, you know, and, and that means to share this wisdom tradition with the world. But, but she never said that the society should seek uh, uh, a personal recognition and, and that we should be above others, you know, we know better, uh, not at all. Um, she, uh, she um, uh, uh, for example, I can, I can mention this here because um, I think I have mentioned this in the, in the chapter about um, her interaction with Madame Blavatsky. She wrote in a letter to Mr. C.W. Leadbeater that Madame Blavatsky told her, Dr. Besson, that what, what drove her to the portal of initiation and in that life was her work for the poor in, in England. It was not excellent, uh, 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 Ex excel, excelling in intellect or in political work, but her compassion to the poor, you know, that's what, 
according to her, that was told to her by, by Madame Blavatsky. So um, I, I feel very humbled to be able to be part of this project. I'm the only survivor of this project, probably not for too long, <laughs> but at least the book is written. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Brother Pedro. Well, as you had mentioned, we endeavor to work till the end. And for this special occasion, uh, on that note, uh, I hand over the proceedings to our brother Shikhar in Adyar. Thank you, Brother Charlie, for uh, such wonderful uh, support that you have given. And we wish you a very long and healthy life, Brother Pedro. So your work is still not done. <laughs> And really, on behalf of Pragya CS Studio and all the, our delegates, participants from different parts of the world, we really extend the heartfelt gratitude for sharing your research and work in such a short span of time. There are almost many messages in the chat box from the delegates thanking you. We cannot read all of them due to lack of time because our brother Charlie has to leave for another meeting soon. And so we thank you, Brother Pedro, on behalf of everyone for taking this time and sharing with us your experience and research. We thank uh, Brother Charlie for accepting this uh, proposal and being the moderator of this session, especially being so much busy with the convention work and the work in Philippines. And last but not the least, we thank all our participants and delegates who took time and joined this session from all over the world and made this session vibrant and vital. And But this is not the end of it. Before we proceed to the closing prayer, we would like to share with you some uh, uh, events that are coming up. Just in another half an hour, uh, we have an event in Theosophical Society in Philippines, the Joint Lodge meeting with Juliet Bates the title of which is the Egyptian Pantheon, the creation myth. So grab your lunch and get ready to attend that session also. And then we have the session uh, organized by Theosophical Society ADR on 1st of October that Brother Pedro just talked. And those questions which we have missed today, please attend this session on 1st October, 2 p.m. India time. That is 8.30 a.m. GMT. So please attend this session. And because this session will be a little different, it will be any patient in India, testimonies from her Indian co-workers. So it will be different from today's session. And whatever questions or uh, things you might have, please uh, join this session and uh, that will be great. And for tomorrow's session uh, for Pragya CS Studio, we again have a special guest from Philippines, Sister Nick Rekha Nahar, who is also the president of TOS in Philippines. And she'll be talking on a very uh, practical subject, bridging our differences, an impossible dream. So let us uh, come together tomorrow, 5 p.m. India time and 7.30 p.m. Manila time to see whether bridging our differences is a possible or impossible dream. And with these words, we come to the close of today's session. And let us come together and close this session by chanting the prayer that Dr. Annie Besant herself penned that we say always as universal invocation. Oh, hidden life vibrant in every atom. O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. O oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee, know he is also one with every other. Shanti. 
Thank you once again, everyone. And if you want to convey your wishes to Brother Pedro, you can unmute yourself and convey, and we will end the meeting in one minute. Thank you, Brother Charlie. See you soon.